you and welcome to everyone. Uh, about 10 years ago, it was 10 years ago, Patrick and I were trying to figure out how we got in touch and I uh, cajoled him into talking uh, to a lecture course I was having to do for about two years and have never done since. But there were two really spectacular events in that lecture course in the fall of 2007 and 8, I believe, and they were both uh, Patrick's appearance where he helped us learn about uh, journalism through his lens, which had included New Hampshire, the Boston Globe, Afghanistan for the Globe, and numerous election campaigns, including Bob Kerry's, which I think was the first. Or right? John Kerry. John yep. Kerry, sorry, right. yep. not Bob Kerry's. John Kerry's, which was the first. And uh, not only enchanted and inspired my students, but also had them in a swoon. Um, and that happened two years in a <laughs> row. It, it's a fact. It's a fact. And so last year, as the um, committee that works on the Tom Sumi series gathered, we, were, we thought it would be important to do an election event, but then we're very conscious because of the library's very important community role that this be nonpartisan, so what could it be? And then I remember that my old friend Patrick Healy had been moved from Broadway where he had been for how many years? Six. Six years in Broadway. Free tickets, what was I thinking, <laughs> leaving? <laughs> uh, back to Electionville. And that had already happened the preceding January. So I went, ding, ding, ding. Politics is theater. And where did I get that idea? <laughs> I went back today to look at what was happening on July 17th when I made this approach to Patrick. And of course, we already had Mr. Trump and the GOP trying to decide how it could fall in love with someone its uh, electorate had fallen in love with. Uh, Hillary was already in line, and Bernie Sanders was already getting great crowds. So I thought, dear Patrick, election is theater, theater is politics, politics <laughs> is theater, can we do something like that? And in his usual gracious, generous style, he immediately came back with, sure, I could do that, how about June? And I'm thinking, how busy is he going to be next June? And in fact, he just cranked out a story just before he came. Filed here. it from Starbucks <laughs> a few blocks down. Exactly. So anyway, here he is, and I'm delighted to welcome him and to allow you to have this swoonable opportunity. Facebook, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks, everyone, for, uh, for having me and for coming out on such a beautiful day. Can everybody hear me okay? That's great. Uh, it is great to be here and not zipping around Southern or Northern California, scrunched up on a bus, trying to balance my laptop, typing out uh, paragraphs, hopefully intelligently, as editors are calling and editors are texting and editors are Snapchatting. It's so much different than uh, my first outing in politics uh, in 2004 with the Kerry campaign when you really just had to file one story a day, very simple, <laughs> and you could go off to the bar and have a drink or get dinner. Uh, everything has really, really changed. And you know, I was hoping to try to, to, to work with the theme that Brooke sort of suggested, looking at my years covering politics, uh, but also theater. I was the John Kerry reporter in 2004 and the Hillary Clinton reporter for the New York Times in 2008. And then uh, they wanted me to move to Washington, D.C. to cover the White House. I said, I need a break. <laughs> and so I decided to uh, take the theater beat. I had gone to school for playwriting and was a young actor back in the day uh, in, in community theater in high school. And just really thought that would be a, a great thing to try. And the reality was a lot of politics is theater. You know, uh, John Kerry was so much better late at night than he was in the morning. He stank in the morning. He was so boring and so windy at his events in the morning. His performance level got so much better during the course of that campaign. When I started covering him in the summer of 2003 after I got back from Iraq, boy, he, oh, he was a, his show would have flopped off Broadway so quickly, he just he could not really engage with audiences. They were coming up for Howard Dean. They were so excited. Uh, and he got better over the course of, of his campaign. 
In 2007, if you watch the first debate between Hillary and Obama, they were both stiffs. I mean, really just sort of clunky, and they would talk too long, and Obama was really professorial, and Hillary was really mechanical. And they grew into candidates who sort of saw the performance happening over time. And you know who else was watching? Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump thought back, back then, and he told me this in one of our many odd, odd interviews that I will get to, uh, you know, how much he was watching how these, how these people were trying to perform and trying to connect to people and how he felt like, especially Hillary, just could be so inauthentic at times, so even just sort of uh, coming off as sort of like alienating to people. Now, he was doing this at the same time he was writing her checks, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the hypocrisy we've looked at a little bit. But he really felt like performance could be everything. That he felt like Americans weren't interested in the 12-point plans or the 40-point plans that Hillary Clinton was known for that performance and being able to connect to a crowd uh, was everything. And you know, you may not necessarily believe what you're selling, but if you know your audience and you know what your audience wants, you give it to them. He told me, I guess back last fall when he was starting to run, he said whenever he was at one of those rallies that gets like 10,000 people, he said, whenever I feel like I'm losing the crowd, whenever I feel like people are sort of getting bored or, you know, murmuring to themselves, you know, he might be talking about one of his businesses in Florida, and then he'll zag and say, and we're going to build a wall, and the wall is going to be great. And it just electrifies the crowd. You know, it has nothing to do with what he was talking about at all. He just goes from A to K instantly. And people got so excited. And it wasn't, just, it wasn't just the idea of the building a wall. Notice that he didn't say, I'm going to build a wall, or the United States is going to build a wall. He always says, we're going to build a wall. And what he realized was that his audience, his sort of theatrical audience, felt so empowered by this billionaire businessman who'd been on TV. And boy, there's nothing more famous in America than being on TV would come to their little town, their little often economically failing town, and say, we're going to do this. You know, we are going to do this. I care. I'm this billionaire who cares about you. We're going to do this. I have never seen a politician do what we call in theater crowd work better than Donald Trump. And that has been an enormous, enormous part of his appeal. You know, about, I guess about five weeks ago, the day before, he was going to do a sit down with Paul Ryan in Washington to try to get Paul Ryan <laughs> to <laughs> endorse him. Uh, I called him up and did one of, our in one of our interviews. Now, on the phone, he, is, he could not be more gracious. He could not be more polite. He's kind of a people pleaser. You know, he sort of wants to know what you're interested in and then tries to kind of serve that up to you. Uh, he happened to know, or because I think his staff told him that I was from the Boston area and, uh, and um, uh, worked at the Boston Globe. And I guess he deduced from my name. Anyway, he always refers to me as smart Irish. Oh, you're smart Irish. That's his thing. Uh, you, know, you can see that in different ways, but he has a very easy time you know, reducing people to you know, uh, ethnicity or what have you. He refers to a colleague of mine as honey or baby all the time. She happens to be a woman. And, um, you know, that evinces mixed reactions. But anyway, on the phone, he's, he, he's he, look, he's fun to talk to. He's fun to talk to. And the media has gotten very slammed, I think, at giving him sort of a free pass on a lot of things, that we haven't checked his, uh, we haven't done enough investigative reporting on his record. We haven't uh, held him accountable for some of the things that he said. Our, our interviews tend to be like debates. Sometimes, I mean, I'll ask him a question about the constitutionality of banning Muslims from coming in the country. How are you going to sort of remotely do that? You know, and he'll start talking about his poll numbers. You know, it's like, I mean, it's, it's sort of like a hall of mirrors. He'll just sort of zig and zag, and I'll press him, and I'll press him. And finally, he sort of goes to what his, his sort of position is, and he'll say it both on the record and off the record. He's like, look, I'm a businessman. 
I start every idea or discussion with a negotiating position, and then I move from there. Very rarely do I get what I actually start with, but I'm going to start with somewhere. And my audience loves it. My audience loves it. The performance aspect, the celebrity aspect of this campaign, and frankly what America has become, you know, from, uh, from the Kardashians to Beyonce to Lady Gaga to the, you know, the incredible power that Twitter has in our lives, in the media's life, uh, in Facebook and social media is vast. And he understands it so well. Anyway, back to the, the interview. So I called him uh, before this Paul Ryan sit down and sort of said, now this was the day after he would clinched the Republican nomination. And I said, you know, you're still doing all these rallies, these big rallies. You've already won the nomination, but you have all these rallies scheduled. Why do you, why do you keep doing them? You know, when are you going, and when are you going to pivot? Are you going to start running differently um, for the general election? And he said, and this is, it, it so sticks in my memory because of the theater job. He said, uh, do you know anything about Broadway? <laughs> he said, yeah, I know a little bit about Broadway. And he said, well, you know, I tried to produce a Broadway show once. In 1970, he put $70,000 into a play, about $400,000 in today's uh, money, uh, starring a very famous actress in Yiddish theater. It flopped after three months. He was done with Broadway. Anyway, he said, so you know, on Broadway, the most important thing, more than a great review or having Audra McDonald or Hugh Jackman to play the most important thing on Broadway, and I'm waiting because I know the answer, and I wondered if he was going to. And he gave the right answer. He said, it's word of mouth. He said, it's word of mouth. That's the most important thing. It's you going to see Hamilton or Wicked or what have you, and then you going to tell her how great it was and her telling her. If it's something that is so exciting and thrilling, that's what spreads. And he said, specifically, he said, word of mouth is the number one thing. And the word of mouth at my rallies is like, you've got to go see it. You've got to go see it. The circus has come to town. <laughs> you know, the greatest showman on earth is here. You've got to go see it. And it, it struck me, this is part of, he, he's running a very, very smart campaign. He knows exactly what he's doing. He decided that he was a, a real success on television with The Apprentice through the celebrity media cultivation of the New York Post uh, and the New York Times and the tabloids to the 80s and 90s and today. And he thought he could cross over. He thought he could cross over from that one celebrity world and bring his performance into politics and that it would sell, 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 sell. He's a businessman, close the deal, sell, sell, sell. Issues? You know, <laughs> relationships with other countries, nah, that's for Hillary to bore people with and put people to sleep with. That's, that's her brand. He was going to perform. Now, this is brilliant for, you know, for, for several reasons. One is, and this comes from the theater, from the theater beat, the most successful uh, Broadway productions uh, in all time financially are The Lion King and Wicked. Lion King and Wicked were not made by artists, Broadway producer types. They were made by major entertainment corporations that were known for other fields. Disney made The Lion King. Universal Pictures made Wicked. Universal Pictures optioned Wicked. It was a book, and it was going to be turned into a movie by Universal. And they decided instead to go along with these musical theater writers who said, we have an idea to turn Wicked into a musical. Forget the movie, we're going to do it as a musical. And Universal said, how much is it going to cost us? They said about $6 million. Universal said, OK, you know, we'll go do it. 15 years later, Wicked has grossed $4 billion worldwide. Wicked is the most valuable property moneymaker for Universal Studios. Universal has made more money off of Wicked than it did off the Jurassic Park movies, off of E.T., off of any movies that it's ever made. Universal found a way to cross over from one entertainment form to another. Disney did it with The Lion King, figuring out a way to turn this, 
cartoon movie, animated movie, into a hit musical. Disney, it, the Lion King has grossed six billion dollars worldwide. You know, huge revenue stream. And these shows only cost like ten million dollars to put on put on Broadway. I mean, amazing. Hamilton is another crossover. It's based on uh, a biography of Alexander Hamilton by Ron Chernow. Uh, straightforward biography, and the musical theater composer Lin-Manuel Miranda, who's a, a Puerto Rican ethnicity, was reading it down in the Caribbean on vacation, and was reading about how Alexander Hamilton himself was an immigrant from uh, the Caribbean who moved to New York as a young man, and he thought, what about having you know, someone of a Hispanic background play Alexander Hamilton? And what about thinking of America actually as a nation of immigrants and the founding fathers, not as descendants of immigrants, but immigrants themselves? What if George Washington was played by an African-American actor? What if Thomas Jefferson was played by an African-American actor? Um, uh, what if uh, Eliza Hamilton, his wife, was played by a, an Asian-American actor? And just and and you know thought it was sort of crazy, and he did a performance, a uh, early performance over the White House in 2009, and Obama and Michelle are laughing at this like you know Latino man uh, rapping about the the Declaration of Independence. It seemed crazy. His sort of genius to cross over not just a book, uh, a biography to a musical, but also cross over. Uh, by colorblind casting, has created you know the biggest Broadway phenomenon since *Wicked* and *The Lion King*. It's now probably next Sunday going to win the Tony Award for Best Musical, a bunch of other Tonys. Uh, Lin Manuel's last performance in the musical is, is in July, and the tickets are going for ten thousand dollars a piece. <laughs> it's it's nutty, but it is it's big big money. I mean, in Broadway, most shows flop. You know, 75% of shows flop and, and producers lose all their money, you know, but when you make a hit, you make a killing. I mean, it really can be something. And it's oftentimes these sort of crossover properties, movies into musicals, books into musicals, that's what's hot. And Donald Trump really, I think, sort of understood this in, in a way. I mean, he, you know, he talked about it a year ago. He talks about it now. He believes that a lot of this is about performance and that CNN and MSNBC and Fox News are in the ratings business. They're, they have an audience. Uh, audiences love politics. So, so the New York Times. New York Times, we have clicks. <laughs> we, have, we like people to click on our stories and we get lots of page views. And he felt like he was going to make himself as utterly accessible as possible, calling into shows, uh, calling me up, calling my fellow reporters up. Now, I haven't talked to Hillary Clinton one-on-one -on -one since 2008. <laughs> Hillary Clinton is not someone who's calling up you know, a lot of folks and, and working people over. Uh, but Donald Trump sort of knew sort of the power of this. He knew, I think he sort of understood in a lot of ways the power of, of celebrity and of performance. Hillary Clinton, you know, the challenge with her um, right now is that the mood of the Democratic Party, is, as many of you know, in terms of primary voters, has moved further and further to the left. And in a lot of ways, she is fundamentally a pragmatist. I'll always remember in 2007 interviewing her in her Senate office about the Iraq war vote. And um, it was clear that Barack Obama was going to run against her from the left in terms of being an anti-war candidate. And talking to her about, did she regret voting to authorize military action in Iraq? Was that something that she was going to be talking about differently as a candidate? Again, this was back in 2007. And she said, you know what, I, have, I was cursed with the responsibility gene. She would talk a lot. In this, she did this for years, talk about the responsibility gene, that she felt sort of very responsible to sort of stand by her positions, that if she felt intellectually something was right at the time, that it would be hypocrisy to try to be apologizing for it years later, or say it was a mistake years later. We saw this play out with the whole email server stuff. You know, it took her 
about four months of just media bashing and media bashing her and Republicans bashing her to get to a place where she could talk about it as some kind of a, as a mistake or something that she, that she regretted. But she's not someone who believes, okay, it's all about performance. As long as I can sort of perform a certain way, uh, I can win over the crowd, tell them what they want to hear, we're going to build a wall, we're going to ban all the Muslims. It doesn't matter how we're going to do it. It doesn't matter if we can get Congress to buy into it or the Supreme Court to allow it to happen. You just tell people what you want to hear. It's, it's antithetical to her core. Hillary Clinton would be a terrible leading lady in a Broadway play. Just lousy. She can't sing. She says this. She's not a very good actress when she's tired. You know, she's someone who's really good in the morning, and by the end of the day, she, you know, her performance, you know, on the stump is a little is is more off. Uh, she'd be a great like production stage manager with like she'd be terrific with sort of like a. Um, you know, a clipboard with yellow ruled paper and making lots of notes. And, you know, that would be, a, you know, she'd be really great at that. She's incredibly organized disciplines, loves round tables and talking about, you know, detailed policy. But performance is not her thing. And, and to her credit, I think a lot of voters really admire that she is someone sort of of substance, someone who's cared about having experiences, not flashing in the limelight. Hillary Clinton spent four years as Secretary of State, and, and think what you will about Benghazi and Syria and the Middle East, but this person could have showboated for four years like crazy. She could have gotten magazine covers, she could have been a show horse, not a workhorse, and you know, she, she'll joke about this. She gained weight, she let her hair go, there was nothing, you know, happy, guy. she was losing sleep, she didn't see friends, she was flying all over the world trying to, giving long, lengthy speeches about, you know, education for girls in third world countries. These were not sort of flashy, fun things. They said no to tons of interview requests. She just wanted to do her job. You may not like how she did her job. You may like how she did her job, but that was it. She wasn't about performing for the spotlight. That was not her thing. It was just sort of getting it done. I'll say a word about, about Bernie Sanders. Um, the Times has been really knocked for its coverage of Bernie Sanders, that we haven't covered him on his own terms, that we've only written about him through the lens of Hillary. Oh, Bernie's talking about the big banks. What does that mean for Hillary? Or, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, Bernie wants free college for all. What, is that gonna, what does that mean about Hillary? And some of that's fair, you know, some of that's fair. The reality was that Hillary Clinton was leading in the polls, you know, for, for a great amount of time. And Bernie was interesting largely as a, as a liberal running to her left. I think we got better in our, in our coverage of Bernie as time went on. But the problem with covering Bernie, and I don't mean to just reduce him again to theater and to a performer, but <laughs> in theater, characters have arcs. You know, the character in the first scene, usually in a successful play or musical, has an arc where they go, they're very different, but alas, and they've learned something, they've changed, they've evolved. Hillary and Obama in that first debate in 2007, Stinko, by the end a year later, like really sharp, good performers. Obama beat McCain so badly in those debates, in large part because Hillary prepped him for it. Obama was a stinker in that first debate against Romney because he hadn't had that kind of experience you know, that, that, that Hillary gave him. Bernie Sanders, I covered his kickoff speech on the shores of Lake Champlain in May of 2015. He is giving virtually the exact same speech now. And there's a lot to admire about Bernie Sanders. There's a lot to admire, my God, about his energy. You know, he's like 72, 73, and he has more stamina than I do. He's incredibly impressive, really sharp, really believes in what he's saying. He believes in consistency. It's all about the big banks. Hillary is corporate. She's not to be trusted. She's saying the right things, you know, now from the liberal playbook. But, you know, bet your bottom dollar. That's not going to be what's happening when she has to appoint a treasury secretary. He really, really, really believes this. But there hasn't been, the problem that we had with him is that there was never an arc with him. He never sort of, 
never kind of grew as a candidate. For a lot of folks, he didn't grow into a president the way that Barack Obama, back in the spring of 2007, it was a little hard to see him as leader of the free world. And again, think what you will about Obama, but he did sort of grow in, in, in stature and he developed a sense about being commander in chief. When Bernie Sanders gave that interview, you know, the, the Daily News, you know, about a month or so ago, boy, you do not go into a New York City tabloid editorial board meeting without being really, really prepped, um, certainly on the Middle East, certainly on your core issues, and he really struggled with delivering answers. You know, he just hasn't, he, for a lot of reporters, I think the, problem, the challenge with covering Bernie is that he, he did not sort of evolve into a presidential figure, and he, he, stay, he stayed a, a supporting actor in this drama. He never sort of grew, he never sort of took the spotlight. I'd love to hear during the Q&A, and we're gonna do questions if folks think that's unfair or if they see it differently, I would love to hear it. But, but those three are really the candidates who we've been covering. Now this is, you know, it looks like on Tuesday, Hillary Clinton is gonna clinch the Democratic nomination. You know, she's gonna be the first woman uh, ever to be the presidential nominee of a major party. <laughs> you know, it looks like that's going to happen. Now, interestingly, the story that I was filing from Starbucks right down the street was about why there isn't more political heat and cultural heat around the idea of uh, the first woman president and what it would mean or say about the country. Eight years ago, whether you liked Obama or didn't like Obama, people were talking about it. What it would mean to have a black president, um, what it would say about us as a society. Did it mean anything? You know, did, did the country have a uh, past, an original sin with race that, that mattered these days? Uh, was Obama even a citizen of the United States? Was he born here? I mean, people were really, really talking about it. And so my story is based on, and, Again, during the Q&A, tell me if you think I'm wrong, but it just doesn't feel like the same conversation is going on about um, a first woman president. Now, does that have to do with Hillary? Does that have to do with the fact that we broke a big barrier eight years ago and it's no longer such kind of an animating issue making history in this country? Uh, interestingly, you know, what a lot of millennials tell uh, pollsters and researchers, is that their mom raised them uh, to say that gender doesn't matter in terms of what you can accomplish in life, you can do anything. And now the moms are saying, you gotta, go, you gotta vote for Hillary, it's a first. <laughs> and the daughters are saying, why would I vote for Hillary? You said it didn't matter. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, you know, there's a, a, a poll show that most people under 30 think there will be a woman in their lifetime, so why does it need to be her? You know, and that's both, and it, and it both deals with mistrust of her, doubts about her authenticity, absolute, oh boy. I mean, the, her, her desire, her relationship with privacy is just, it, it may end up being her Achilles heel in this election. You know, she really wanted, and some people may feel like she should be in jail over the email server. You know, there, she, she, you know, there's a lot there, people wonder, is the FBI really ever gonna look into this in a legit way, or is Obama kind of wired it for her? Whatever you think about it, I mean, the thing to, to realize about her is that her sort of insistence on privacy and on kind of controlling her narrative, controlling her play, is absolute and it's greater than any politician I've ever seen. Some people find that paranoid. Here's the thing. And I understood it. Uh, in, in 2007, 2008, when she was running for president against Obama, Obama's campaign was trying to kill her. Just every day, beat her, kill her, saying the nastiest things, trying to undercut her, lots of manipulation. And she loses, and she's wounded. She, she loses. And then November of 2008, Barack Obama asks her to be Secretary of State. Now, for students of, uh, of political history, you may remember that oftentimes when something goes south overseas, the White House throws the State Department under the bus. And she knew that while Obama might 
like her and want her to be Secretary of State. All those people around Obama in the White House, all those people were the same people who were trying to kill her for the last you know, two years or so. And so among the things that she wanted was absolute and total control over her email, over any personal correspondence. So no little elves, little elves in the White House could go and like pick through government servers. Not going to happen. So it was, at, you know, there was this desire for absolute and total control. And she has said, and it's now been revealed in some of her emails, that she didn't want anything personal to get out. Nothing personal to get out through, even if she had to use State Department email. This is a person who is who's so private, who's so insistent on things like not releasing her paid speeches to Goldman Sachs and to Wall Street, so insistent on uh, fighting any suggestion of a double standard that, that Hillary should have to release her speeches and Donald Trump isn't going to get pressure for not releasing his tax returns. She's so galled by the idea that people want to inspect her and invade her privacy and not others that she has created this sort of cocoon in a lot of ways around herself, a bubble to some extent that keeps her shielded. If we're running a presidential campaign right now in a country where you essentially have this celebrity who knows how to use theater, which demands sort of transparency, openness, I'm going to play to the crowd, give you what you want, tell you we're going to build that wall, this and that. And, and really kind of connect to the zeitgeist that is happening in parts of the Republican Party, um, not necessarily in the Hamptons, you know, but in parts of the country that are really, really financially struggling and who don't see answers, not so much from Democrats, but from just the system in DC, the people who are running things. He's giving them what they want. He's giving them this performance. Hillary Clinton, the, the challenge for her is somehow, t is she going to be able to get out of this sort of this cocoon, this bubble? You can't be on stage trying to sell your 11 o'clock number, you know, if you're in this sort of straitjacket, concerned about how the audience is feeling about you at every single minute. It's just, it's, 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 it's a real challenge for her. Challenge for the media, you know, some of you may have read the stories, and I think they're pretty interesting, about how does CNN and MSNBC give equal time to Hillary when Donald Trump is calling up every five minutes <laughs> trying to get on anybody's show, and they'll put him on. Because in, in fairness, you know, and also under you know, some FCC rules, the media has to give, uh, the airwaves has to give some equal time to Hillary, you know, as to Trump. So you would think, okay, this is you know open for Hillary. Call in, call, come on. We're happy to hear from you. You know, talk. She doesn't want to do that. This is such a challenge for her campaign. How do they run against this this you know master performer? You know, when she isn't someone who enjoys the media, she's suspicious of the media. The media has accused her of everything up to murder. You know, and Vince Foster, and she has not forgotten that. She's not forgotten that. She's not forgotten that. She's not forgotten how Bill Clinton lost re-election in Arkansas in 1980, and the media in Arkansas said the reason was because Hillary Clinton was, sorry, not Hillary Clinton, she was Hillary Rodham. She'd not taken his name at that point. And she was this Chicago, Yale-educated, snooty lawyer, who came, woman lawyer who came down and kept her name. And she got fricasseed in the, in the Arkansas media over being Hillary Rodham. And voters didn't like it. She changed her name to Hillary Clinton. Bill Clinton won in 1982, got back the governorship and, and so on. This is what a lot of people have this problem with, with Hillary, as, as I think a lot of you know. And, and I think this is part of what I was writing about in the, the we'll call it the Starbucks story. <laughs> um, I should give the Hamptons a dateline for that story. Uh, it, you know, basically that a lot of people see her as a Clinton first and sort of a perennial politician second and as a woman third. You know, they see her as someone who is kind of ridden to power, uh, you know, on her husband's coattails that probably if she hadn't married Bill Clinton and risen up, um, she'd probably be like a federal judge or an appellate judge. She'd probably be a great judge. 
you know, but would she be necessarily president of the United States? Bill Clinton likes to tell this story, and Hillary Clinton says it's, it's not true, <laughs> but he likes to tell it anyway, that when they were dating, he said to Hillary, well, actually, you, uh, you shouldn't marry me, you shouldn't marry me, you should move back to Chicago and run for office because you're the most brilliant political mind of our time. And Hillary said, no way. <laughs> no one would ever vote for me. They'd see me as this, like, you know, kind of bitchy woman who was coming and, like, turning people off. It, you know, it would never happen. Hillary doesn't say, says that's, that's not true. But, but it sort of goes to the sense that the politics of performance, the politics of working an audience, the politics of engaging with the crowd, you know, isn't one of her strengths. I know a lot of people in the media felt like one of her most winning moments, and this goes to the narcissism of the media, well, one of her most winning moments of the campaign was when she said at one of the televised debates, look, I'm not a very good politician. You know, I'm not very good at this. I'm not like my husband. I'm not like Barack Obama. It still, after all these years, makes me uncomfortable. I'm not very good at it. It was, the reason why the media liked it, and you know, I responded to it, is because it's so genuine. And that's something that a lot of reporters struggle with is, is who is Hillary Clinton? You know, who, who, what is the genuine side of her? There's the side that her friends and her staff describe, but a lot of people don't see that. A lot of people don't, be, they believe that's sort of an artificial construct that, you know, is just being served up for spin. In that moment, though, I, I just think it sort of corresponds to what she has talked about, uh, you know, about herself and, um, uh, and, you know, what sort of we've seen kind of in person. But how does she, you know, look, this campaign is going to be, it's going to be ugly. You guys all know that. It's going to be very, very tough. You know, Donald Trump, during one of our interviews, was sort of gleefully going through all of the things that he is going to attack her on. The media can say that Bill Clinton's extramarital affairs are old news and nobody cares about that stuff. He does not believe it. He does not believe it at all. He feels like he's found a way to talk about it because he's talking about Hillary's character in it, that she sort of enabled his abuse of these women because of things that she has said, you know, things that she has said. We have to destroy this woman's story. We have to get this person. Monica Lewinsky is a narcissistic Looney Tune. And then in a way, by knowing that he was cheating on her and by focusing on, you know, on, on uh, derailing the women or protecting Bill Clinton, that he enabled further bad behavior. And, and Trump thinks, look, Trump thinks that this will, will resonate with people, that fundamentally there's something weird about the wife of a former president becoming president and the former president being back in the White House, that there's something weird about that and that there's a lot of Americans who are going to have a problem with it. Maybe BS, we don't know, but this is part of his theory of the case. And from his point of view, it's all about selling it. It's like selling it, selling the wall, selling the Muslim ban. He may not give a fig about it, and he may well know, and he does know, that he's been married three times, and he's like, been pretty open about all of his extramarital affairs. But say what you will about Donald Trump, he's, he's, this is not news. He is shameless <laughs> you know, in a lot of ways. And he believes if, if he's, you know, if he, if he, when he says these things that it'll sell, that it will work, that this is what people believe and what people feel, and that that's what, you know, really sort of connects. And, you know, those six years of sitting in Broadway and off-Broadway theaters and seeing the way that performance sort of connected with people, and the reality is a lot of audience members, just like a lot of voters, they don't go home and click on you know, the 10-point plans on the campaign websites. They don't watch uh, Chris Matthews and Rachel Maddow and CNN and Fox to the same degree that I do and maybe a lot of people here in the room do. Um, that, that what they're going to respond to is you know, how likable is the person? Is the person sort of saying what I think? You know, how gutsy is the person? Is this sort of delivering the, the sort of the feel of what the country needs? And he's, he's all about that. You know, I, I use the word shameless. Maybe that's not a fair word, but I think he basically is going out and sort of saying, you know, this is what people want and I'm going to deliver it. Hillary is going out and saying, this is what people you need and this is what I'm going to sell. A lot of people find that to be 
daddy government or mommy government and you know they, they recoil from it or they see her as, as a flawed messenger, as a flawed performer. What's gonna happen? I really don't know. You know, New York is not a swing state. <laughs> Donald Trump thinks that he can win New York. Mm, I think that's sort of a stretch. Um, but you know, it's gonna come down, there's no question, to these uh, you know, 8, 10, 12 states. The debates are gonna be like something we've just never seen before. I mean, the audience, the ratings for those debates are gonna be through the roof. And Trump is really says, you know, he's ready to get up there and hurl this stuff in Hillary's face and really go after her. I wrote a story a couple months ago about how, in a lot of ways, for all of Hillary's policy ideas and preparation and qualifications, whether you think they're qualifications or not, in a lot of ways, her path to the White House may just be a path through the crucible of humiliation. Like, can she endure all of the nasty stuff that he throws at her? And can she just sort of, you know, keep her head up and sort of ride through it? And it's amazing that for Hillary Clinton has had to deal with that stuff for like 30 years, you know, from the media, from Bill Clinton's mistresses, from Bill Clinton himself. I mean, the woman has been so embarrassed in the public spotlight, you know, for so long. And in a way, it, you might think it's sort of karmic, karmically fitting that to finally get the ultimate prize that she's wanted, you know, for you know at least eight years, probably a lot longer, she's going to be going up against the guy who will be who will make you know Ken Starr look like Snoopy, you know. I mean, really, he's Trump is going to be really, really tough. So those debates are going to be incredible, and um, and it's going to come down to the eight or ten or twelve states. You know, the VP thing, both campaigns who talk, you know, privately or internally to their people. You know, Trump, Trump's interested. Trump's view is I don't need a pollster because I can read the audience. I know the audience. And when, he, when we talked to him about his problems, his, his big problem, as probably a lot of you know, is with white women. You know, the, Rep the Republican nominee, <laughs> well, black women too, but no, 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 but white women because since 1996, the Republican nominee has won a majority of white women. You know, it was uh, Bob Dole, George W. Bush, George W. Bush, McCain, Romney. Uh, Republican nominees always won kind of a majority of white women. Donald Trump is losing white women right now to Hillary Clinton. A lot of women, maybe not a lot in this room, but a, a, I've done interviews certainly with, with plenty, have, have deeply mixed feelings about Hillary Clinton, they, they, well, let's not get into that. But as you can, as you know, probably, had a lot, a, a range of feelings about her, about whether she's deserving, about whether she's qualified, about whether she should be in jail or in the White House. There's a, this is, this is the country, you know, this is the country, and, and people are entitled to their opinion. A range of, um, a range of feelings. So who Hillary picks as a VP? isn't really gonna change you know, a lot of that but, but tr in terms of helping her. But Trump is interesting because he doesn't believe that he has a problem with white women. That ultimately, everybody's gonna, you know, the women love me, you know, the blacks love me, the Muslims love me, the women love me, that's, that's, how, he, that's how he speaks. Um, you know, but he ultimately believes that you know, women may have plenty of problems with him but he can, outperform Hillary and at the end of the day, you know, it's Hillary. Like, do you really want her as president? Do you really want her? Four years of Trump isn't gonna, this is what they're selling, isn't gonna ruin the country, you know, the country will be okay. No, no, but do you want, and, and you know, give me a chance, it'll be like an enema in the system and like <laughs> clean it out. But, or do you, do you want, do you want Hillary? And look, it's, a, it's effective. I mean, Ronald Reagan in 1980, you know, against Carter, you know, my dad would get the line better than I do, but, you know, are you better off today than you were four years ago? You know, Donald Trump's version of that line is, you know, do you want a President Hillary Clinton? And, you know, a lot of the country is going to say yes, and a lot of the country is going to say no. She wants to make it a referendum uh, about him, you know, pretty much the same question. They're hoping that for all the mishigas of the next five months, um, 
the debates, everything, that on that first Monday of November, people are going to wake up, maybe Tuesday, but probably Monday, people are going to wake up and they're going to say, how are we going to feel on Wednesday if Donald Trump is president-elect? And that, and, that and that as uncomfortable as people are with her and she knows she's not likable enough or she is likable enough, that as much as people you know, might just oh, roll their eyes or, or their stomachs turn you know, at the thought of a President Hillary Clinton, that the country is too important to, to, to risk it on Trump, you know, and they got to vote. And these are, this is weird, folks. This is a weird way to run a presidential, a presidential campaign, sort of you know, kind of hoping that the other side is just so abhorrent uh, you know, that, uh, that you're going to go. So anyway, this is a, lost my train of thought, sorry, a little bit. Um, VP, you know, we'll see. I mean, the, the, the kind of the, the, the betting right now is that Hillary feels very confident um, that she can beat Trump and that she doesn't need to pick, you know, an Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders to unite the party, that the party will unite on its own and that, you know, if she was going to pick a liberal, it would probably be like Sherrod Brown from, uh, you know, from Ohio. But she may be more inclined to sort of geek out and get sort of another policy wonk. And that could be uh, Senator Michael Bennett from Colorado, the Labor Secretary Tom Perez, um, you know, Kim, Tim Kaine from Virginia. You know, but, and, and sort of the hope that, you know, the, the sort of the centrist uh, credentials these folks um, you know, won't, won't sink the boat. Trump, you know, a lot of people think Trump should pick a woman. Again, he thinks, eh, I'll be fine. I don't need a woman. We'll see. It's a real, you know, real guessing game on that. But, um, you know, I think at this point, though, I've probably talked enough. And I would love to open it up to questions if I could. What I would ask is, because we may have a number of questions, if people could keep it to like one sentence and also to and make it a question as opposed to a statement because we all have statements I think that we could take up time with and I don't want to go too far but sir in the purple you're first yep so the question was is the press going to do its job and hold his feet to the fire uh, over the next five months and really kind of grill him and not let him bob and weave and ask follow-up after follow-up if necessary I think we're I think we're heading in that direction. Let's be let let's be but let's be honest. Let's be frank. It kind of makes for lousy TV. I mean that's that's the pro, that's the problem. I think for some you know in some ways, it when it's repetitive, 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 uh, it can get it can get sort of like okay let's move on, or it can seem like the media is sort of beating up on him. But I think I don't know if how many of you saw the interview that Jake Tapper did with Donald the other day, but he asked him repeatedly, I think sort of like 20 times, you know, tried to, to, to nail him down on one issue. And I think we're going to be seeing more of that. I know that at the Times, at the Wall Street Journal, there's a lot of investigative reporting that's going on, stories that will be coming out in the weeks and months to come uh, on both, you know, on both candidates. But I think what you're going to see and what you're asking about, I think, is, is the sense of not letting him Bob and weave and treating him, frankly, as an as an entertainer, but trying to hold him. I think you're going to see more of that. I think because it's it's demanded. I think he sort of has antagonized the press to some extent now, and and maybe you know. But I don't think it's a matter of the press growing a pair. I think in a lot of ways there was a feeling like he, you know, that that we didn't really know. I, I think this happened with Obama too a little bit in 2007, 2008. I think. A lot of tough questions were asked of Hillary, and at least with Obama early on, it was sort of like, what does Obama's jump shot say about how we'll run the country? And <laughs> what does Obama's years at the Harvard Law Review say about how we'll run the country? You know, the, the tough questions. I know a lot of some people feel like Obama won the presidency without really tough questions ever being asked of him. We didn't know what we were getting or how qualified he even was. You know, I, but I think that's going to happen. So, yep. So, okay, so I guess the idea is, is that, um, you know, is Trump sort of the Kim Kardashian of politics, kind of, you know, famous for being famous and not much else, and um, Hillary being more the kind of Beyonce, Lady Gaga figure, like actually, 
uh, having some talent at this and kind of knowing what works. Uh, works for me, <laughs> you know, I mean, in some ways, you know, but look, look, you, you, this in a way, this isn't a laughing matter to a, to a lot of folks at, at Trump rallies. We tend to zero in on the, on the violent person or the handful of, of violent people. But there are like 12,000 other people at these rallies who wait. I mean, these lines in New Hampshire were just not to be believed. New Hampshire is cold in February. My godmother lives up in New Hampshire, and I've been skiing on those mountains. It is cold in February. And these folks are lined up for three hours waiting to get in to hear Trump, not to sucker punch you know, a protester, but because they felt like he that his embrace, that his sort of vision for America being great again was something that they could buy into. So, you know, he may not have the 10-point plan that Beyonce and, and Hillary Clinton might have, but, you know, he offers at least a vision that, uh, not that people compare to Reagan, but that he brought s sort of a, sp let's just say like a spirit that they, they feel like making them feel good again or, or strong again. Kind of sells. So, uh, na yeah, ma'am, right there. Yeah. Uh, the question is what is Nate Cohn's latest statistics at this race? Nate Cohn is a great uh, reporter at the Times who draws um, a lot on sort of data modeling and polling modeling. I don't know the answer to that question, sorry. <laughs> In terms of people being unsettled about how little, how he doesn't know certain things. So, the question is uh, to what extent will the election be influenced by voters being like just terrified that Trump? doesn't know the basic functions of the Supreme Court or uh, Congress or the White House. Look, I mean, he says, he's a guy who says uh, the Supreme Court signs bills, you know. <laughs> this, you know, Congress signs bills. We all, probably like a pretty college-educated, like, group in here. You know, you, again, you go to, and I don't mean to create classist or educationist, you know, divides, but a lot of country doesn't care. Like they don't care. They didn't care that George Bush said uh, strategy. That people, you know, he was he was voted into office twice. You know, they see it as kind of like, you know, coastal elite snobbery that people get caught up in the words. And to, on the other hand, the people who are going to be terrified by that are probably going to be terrified by a lot of other things that that Trump does. I grew. Up, I loved history classes. I loved sort of civics classes. He said things like that to me on the phone, and I've sort of been, I sort of like winced a little bit because it, it offends my, you know, situate Massachusetts <laughs> sensibility. It's sort of like, oh, you know, why is he saying, um, you know, that Congress can indict someone? It just, you know, didn't get it. But uh, yes, sir. So the, yeah, the role of super PACs, so the question is, what about super PACs in this election? It's really interesting. I, I think there's a, a, a view emerging that, um, that they're not as powerful as we thought they were going to be after the Citizens United case. Now, a lot of people uh, feel still that the Supreme Court's decision on, on Citizens United, you know, was the biggest injection of financial corruption into campaign finance. Basically, you know, I can write a huge check uh, to a to a super PAC, and in some cases, depending on the classification, not even be identified as having done so, and it can be spent you know, for anything, but, you know, look, a lot of us felt in March of 2015 that Jeb Bush was going to be the nominee, and it was because of money. He had a super PAC that had $100 million. He had the, the kind of the Bush kind of fundraising uh, circle. He was a kind of a traditional Republican who was, I don't know, think what you will of Jeb Bush, uh, but I, I spent some time with him. He was a very thoughtful guy. He, I think he, he, I think in a lot of ways he, uh, not in a lot of ways. I think he, he, he believed in his ideas. He spent a lot of time thinking about them. He was very interested in talking to you about them. He wasn't the most eloquent guy, certainly in the world. But I, I you know, in a lot of ways, I think he cared very much about the country. You know, his views may have, you know, screwed up the country depending on your political persuasion or not if he won the presidency. But he was someone who spent a lot of time with policy. And thought, but super PAC, that super PAC did not help him. I mean, Jeb Bush, you know, you know, barely, you know, uh, registered in polls. So it'll be interesting to see what'll happen. Trump isn't really interested in having a super PAC. Hillary's got a big one, you know, and she's going to have a lot of money going in. So, you know, we'll see. But.
Yes, the question, that's a great question. I mean, it, you know, um, please tell me if I'm getting it right. But, but basically, uh, is, there, is there a line, does a line exist where uh, knowing how to entertain or having a, a personality that can sort of skate you through things simply isn't enough that the, that the, the, the things you're proposing, like deporting 12 million people, you know, are, are so vast and so complex that you can't just simply skate by on person frightening, right. I think that's really true. I mean, I think we see it sort of in poll numbers with Trump. You, know, you read some of these polls and you think there's no way he can win. You know, people are gen people, so many people are so sort of scared about the idea of a Trump presidency or think it would be so dangerous for the country that it, that it simply can't play out. The thing is, and not to, not to answer with just political strategy, but he needs to do well in these eight to 12 states in particular that'll, that'll make the difference. And Hillary will very much, you know, I think try to make sure that people are hearing what he's saying and, and I think a lot of people will be frightened by that. I think the media is getting better at sort of saying bluntly, you know, what he's, what he's talking about. Like in CNN the other day, Trump was denying that he said that he thought Japan should have nuclear weapons. And CNN, very interestingly, some of you may have seen that, in its little cryon, it said, Trump, colon, denies saying Japan should have nuclear weapons, parentheses, he did, parentheses, <laughs> which is like, you know, used to be seen as real editorializing on the media's part, but instead is really a level of kind of blowing the whistle and saying, hey, he's saying frightening things and you need to, you need to know this. Yeah, I, the, the, the hope, again, in the Clinton campaign, but I think for a lot of citizens, is that we're going to see all of this play out over the next five months, see what his convention is like, see what his VP is like, see what he's like in those debates. And by Monday or Tuesday of, of that week in November, people will just say, absolutely not. You know, and, and maybe she's terrible and she's a liar or she should be indicted, but th he, he's beyond the pale and he's not what America, you know, is about. But, uh, yep, you had your hand. Hi, Judith, yes. <laughs> Former Democratic Party state chair. I'm so, I, I, I think about the double standard a lot and I have, you know, I wrote a story in uh, 2008 that it, that's one that I regret writing. And it was about uh, Hillary Clinton's laugh. And it was about how she uses her laugh sort of strategically, which her campaign aides, you know, describe to me that sometimes when she gets a tough question, uh, she'll sort of break into this kind of big belly laugh. She has a great laugh. And in a way, it gives her sort of time. It both can be disarming and kind of diffuse. Uh, the question, but it gives her a few seconds to just think about what her answer is. And um, I referred to it as a cackle. And, and it got through and we ran it online. And, and um, you know, that was a story that looking back on it, I regret, I regret sort of using that word. And I think about it a lot. I think I was leaning in a little bit to being, um, trying to be kind to Jeb Bush, maybe because I felt like the room might not <laughs> be so inclined to uh, think kindly toward Jeb Bush, and so I was trying to give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. You know, on the other hand, you know, I certainly have my own personal issues uh, with Jeb Bush and with all the candidates that I, I try to put on the shelf. I try to think of members of my own family who, you know, who I love and respect and think incredibly highly of, who are Republicans and who very much feel very strongly about their views and who might have supported John Kasich or Jeb Bush. And I don't, I try to l listen to them and, and hear them and, and, you know, and respect their opinion. But you're right about Hillary Clinton. I think that's true. I think in a lot of times we talk about her um, as a policy wonk as if that's sort of a bad thing. Uh, I think that um, some people have sort of, you know, have kind of reduced her to sort of being like, Obama's called professorial, and that's kind of some people use that positively, and some people use that negatively. And I think in I think in some ways I think 
watching our language around it, though, is something we try to do a little bit more of. I know with Trump, you know, we wrote, I mean, this was a tricky one. You know, we, after that first debate with Megyn Kelly, um, we wrote like three front page stories in kind of in a row about his language about women. You know, I ended up writing a, a very long story about sort of his instances of uh, his language. Spent a week looking at like every word that he said and <laughs> transcribing his speeches and, and talking to sort of experts on rhetoric and history about sort of the, the demagoguery that he uses, the violent kind of imagery that he uses in his language. And, you know, we wrote a recent story about his treatment of women over the years and how he has sort of reduced them to physical appearance and, and objectifies and, and rates them. And a question that comes to me sometimes is, we could write so many more stories and yet to what extent do we become almost sort of, sort of biased and undercut our own credibility by not so much piling on but like, just shining the spotlight endlessly on the subject matter. You know, at a certain point, voters know who he is. You know, voters know who he is. They know what he's saying, what he says. They know, you know, when he gets on those, that debate stage, the way that he treats, you know, Hillary Clinton, they're going to know, they're going to have his number. You know, do they care? Do they react to it? You know, the media aiding and abetting, um, not to let the media off the hook, but uh, to some extent, I think we're going to know who we're voting for, you know, by by November, um, and we'll and we'll see. So we just have time for like a couple more questions. So yeah, you've had your hand up. I think we'll see. And look, I might be wrong about the debates. I mean, everybody, you know, Donald Trump's campaign keeps saying, you know, he's going to pivot and be more presidential. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe he may decide that in those debates he needs to be less about beating up on on Hillary and more about trying to seem like a, you know, trying to seem like, a, you know, as presidential as possible. I think from the media's point of view, it will be very interesting, and this goes to something Judith, you know, was getting at, you know, to what extent is, is the media's responsibility to be asking, like, really substantive questions that aren't bait, that aren't like, here we go, we're serving up a question to Mr. Trump, you know, where he'll be able to, like, take this swing at Secretary Clinton, you know, that just gets lots of headlines and ratings. I don't really know what's going to happen. I mean, I think, I think my sense is, talking to some people in the media who may be involved in the debates, I think there's going to be a, a real effort to sort of lean to the broccoli and focus on that, and then it'll be up to, to Trump and to, to Clinton to decide, you know, how tough they're going to get. Ah, I don't, maybe last question, I think, so. I, I, I think this, to some extent, goes back to the, the theme and the construct of the, of the talk. And we decided not to make this a, you know, a policy talk, so I hope I've tried to sort of keep, keep to a certain theme, like it or not. But uh, what happened was Donald Trump decided, I think, in a lot of ways, that this would sell, that this would work, that he didn't think that his advantage in going into a presidential campaign was good. OK. The American, the American people. Right. That's a great question. I mean, I think in some, at some rallies when I go to, the thing that you hear the most, I know it's become a little cliche, is that they feel like he says what he thinks and that he's sort of genuine and authentic. And they don't care whether he graduated from high school or college or Wharton or whatever. They see him as someone who tells it like it is, made a billion dollars or so or less or more. Um, you know, and cares about America and says sort of the right things. This, the dumbing down, you know, you could look at it on a few levels. The media is very, look, newspapers are dying in a lot of ways. Cable TV is, is sort of fighting for a smaller and smaller piece of the pie. You know, I think there's a desire to have him on. It helps with ratings. I think the questions are going to be getting, you know, a little bit more tougher. Um, are we having Trump on and rather than dumbing down, you know, going into a really long, lengthy discussion about um, Israel and Palestine? No, that hasn't really happened. Will it happen? 
I don't know. Maybe it's people. It, we tend to react to what's in the news right now. I think there'll be there will be some of that. But I, in talking to voters, you know, a lot of folks in the states that I visited with with Trump, with Hillary, with Bernie, you know, they and this would happen at Bernie rallies too. They weren't interested in whether or not, you know, Bernie really knew how to break up the big banks, you know, or kind of what Bernie's policy plan was to convince uh, Congress to, to get a Republican Congress to, to do this. That wasn't what the, they, they were interested in this kind of this sort of firebrand idea about, about changing Washington totally as it is. So, but dumbing down, you know, I guess you could look at, you know, uh, certainly education, graduation rates, uh, you know, reading and math, you know, in the country, what we sort of focus on, the social media rise. I mean, you know, you go into classrooms when I speak today. I know when I was growing up, you know, I wasn't in a classroom where everybody was sort of looking at their phone or like tweeting and retweeting and posting. It just wasn't, it wasn't done. I don't mean to sound like a fuddy-duddy, but it just, you know, that wasn't done. So. You know, I think there are a lot of trends happening in the country that are less about uh, stopping the dumbing down and more about engaging with each other and talking to each other and, you know, sort of going on the social media. So um, I, I think we're out of time, but I'll talk to you personally. And thank you so much for coming out. So thank you.